This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. The University of Oklahoma has expelled two student fraternity members, it says, led a racist song caught on video. Members of Sigma Alpha Epsilon are seen on a bus singing a song that includes a racial slur and a vow that no black people will ever join their group. The school says the two students who allegedly led the song were expelled for creating, quote, a hostile learning environment, and that all those involved, quote, will learn it is wrong to use words to hurt, threaten and exclude. Hundreds of students have marched at the school in a show of protest against racism. We're joined by three people to have an interesting discussion about where we go from here. Joining us from Oklahoma City is Rashid Campbell, senior at University of Oklahoma, who's majoring in African and African American studies. He's been participating in the protests against the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity over the racist song. Last year, he won the national debate tournament, becoming the first African American to win the title in the 67 year history of the tournament. It's a nationwide debate tournament. He beat out over 160 other contestants. Also with us from New Orleans is Tracy Washington, president and CEO of the Louisiana Justice Institute, leading civil rights attorney in New Orleans. And here in New York, Vince Warren is with us, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. We're talking about the song that was caught on videotape, and among the words of the song, uh, it is rife with the N-word. There will never be an N-word in SAE, but they use the word. These are the lyrics. There will never be an N-word in SAE. You can hang him from a tree, but he'll never sign with me. There'll never be an N-word in SAE. Now, the president of the university, the head of the University of Oklahoma, is the former senator, David Boren. Uh, he has expelled the two students who are caught on the videotape, though it looks like there's a whole chorus in the bus who are singing this song. Uh, we're, this is part two of our discussion. Um, Rashid Campbell, what you think needs to be done? Just two students were expelled. The two particular were they actually members of SAE or were they pledges? being told to sing uh, the my, song? From my understanding, they were freshmen, um, and I'm not sure where in the process they were, uh, but I believe they were uh, in, um, initiated within the fraternity. So they were a part, uh, but they were uh, freshmen, to my knowledge. Do you think that um, just the two who were leading this song uh, should have been expelled? What should happen with the other people in the bus? It sounded like there was uh, quite a chorus there. Right. Right. I think it's a combination of, uh, of two things. The first thing is I think there needs to be an expulsion uh, to be a, a, a symbolic in the ways that the University of Oklahoma is standing against injustice and racism as a whole. I think the second part is the education um, that we were speaking about before and the ways that we can conduct racial sensitivity courses or things that we can have uh, conferences and meetings to where people who had not been exposed to knowledge around not perpetuating racism can be exposed. I think that it is the part of uh, the part or the responsibility is twofold. It is on the students, and they must be responsible for what they said and what they participated in. But it's also on the history that has created that chant. Uh, they weren't the inventors of this chant, and this is well-known knowledge. So we need to put a onus on who invented those things and how can we stop that from perpetuating itself. Yeah, Vince Warren, I want to ask you about that. It was obviously one of the, the fraternity members who was expelled, Parker Rice, said in, the, in his public apology that he was taught the song. We were taught the song. Um, of course, SAE, the fraternity, denied it, saying, the national fraternity does not teach such a racist, hateful chant, and this chant is not part of any education or training. So could you say a little about how widespread you think this phenomenon is, uh, racism that is embedded within these institutions? Well, I think it's. I think the question about whether they're pledged, whether they were told to sing this song, or whether this is something that they embraced, is a really significant one. Either way, it's a problem because if they were told to do it, you know, they have a choice not to. Uh, but at some level, if the, if the structure or the system is dictating that they do it, it really implicates the system as much as the individuals. When you know, when we were in in Selma, Bernard Lafayette told this interesting story about structural racism, and he said, and explain that who Bernard Lafayette. Is. Bernard Lafayette was a was a longtime um, activist that was dispatched to Selma, Alabama, to f try to figure out the strategy uh, for desegregation and to to change the foothold that they that they had in Selma. And in fact, SNCC had said that. 
no change could come to Selma because the black folks were too scared and that the white folks were too mean. But Bernard Lafayette told the story about in Selma, um, they didn't have to drop any, they didn't have to put off any bombs like they did in Montgomery. And in fact, the White Citizen Council didn't meet around a burning cross, but they met in the bank. And the reason why that's important is because this conversation is not just about people having a discussion on a school bus. This is about having a conversation in the context of a structural system, which is, an, which is a fraternity. And that's a, a huge problem. You have to imagine that this is something that is taught to other people, and that is, that is part of what that fraternity's history is that they need to disavow. And I think, you know, the, probably the, the more important piece here is um, that if this had happened in the context of a school debate, if these folks had said, we want to have a school discussion that says black folks should not be allowed in SAE, I think that is protected under First Amendment activity, and that is a discussion, and that's the learning moment. But that's not what happened. Here we have people on the bus that it's perfectly fine to say these things amongst themselves, and it's perfectly fine to put them up on the Internet, and then we're going to be rub, uh, washing our hands and trying to figure out where is the structural problem here. This is endemic in this institution in that, in that um, fraternity, and I think that the, the president did the right thing, particularly about taking the fraternity letters down, and that fraternity needs to be investigated nationally, because we were going to find that this is a problem not just in Oklahoma, this is a problem everywhere. I want to turn to the University of Oklahoma president, the former Oklahoma senator, um, U.S. Senator David Boren. This is not our way. These are not our values. This is not who we are, and we won't tolerate it not for one minute from anybody. So those students will be, will be out of that house by midnight tomorrow night. The house will be closed. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it won't be back, at least not while I'm president of the university. So they've closed SAE on campus at the University of Oklahoma, and the two students caught on the videotape leading the chant have been expelled. Tracy Washington, you feel this, though you are, uh, you condemn what they sang, you feel expulsion is the wrong answer. I feel expulsion is the wrong answer for lots of reasons, and so I'm going to, I'm going to disagree a little bit with my, my, my very dear friend Vince Warren to this extent. Too often, we take this, you know, uh, sort of all or nothing, we're going to make this expulsion, we're going to take down these letters, and then we don't do anything else, and we don't really confront the, the roots of the structural racism. And that is also the tolerance that was also going on in that community around what was happening inside that fraternity. So let me be really clear. Um, we get students at school who are not fully formed. I'm an adjunct professor at Dillard University. I deal with issues on college campuses in my practice. We know that we have to form and make better people. The teachable moment, the teachable moment for President Warren was to sit back, take a deep breath, a hard deep breath, and swallow and say, you know what? This isn't only SAE. SAE's got to go, most certainly. But there were faculty members and there were administrators on my campus who knew what was going on at SAE. We don't have a mouse problem, as I said in my blog. We have mice. And we're going to exterminate the, the, this, this vermin that's called racism, not by hiding it, not by putting out one trap. We're going to teach this entire community about anti-racism. And even those students who we know were singing and chanting and, and have those thoughts, and the ones that we don't know, because we can't identify all of them, we're going to teach all of them. And that's what leadership is on a college campus, and it's hard. Now, the expulsions have taken place. If, if we want to call them symbolic expulsions, you know, I, I'm not the president, and I'm not Rashid, and, and God bless, I'm not on that campus. But what has to be done is for that university to understand it's not just those two young men. It's not four young men. It's not just that fraternity. It's the entire community. Structural racism is not just the racism that was there, but what had, what had been allowed by the University of Oklahoma. Hire a chief diversity officer. Ensure 
that every student, faculty member, and administrator over the next two, three years, year, if it were up to me as the chief diversity officer, undergo anti-racism training. Universities are here to teach and to make better people. And on that, right now, right now, I'm going to give, as a college professor, I'm going to give President Bourne a C minus. Rashid Campbell, could you respond to what Tracy Washington said and also talk about the protest that you helped lead outside the president's office? Well, firstly, uh, I agree with uh, a lot of things that Tracy said. I think that this is a historical problem, and I do not want uh, this to be a media frenzy for a week or so, and then once we come back from spring break, we're, uh, from spring break, we're back at the university, we're back on campus, everybody act like racism doesn't exist anymore. I think that it needs to be some structural changes in the way that we engage racism and the way that we teach those who don't know about racism uh, on campus. The thing that, uh, uh, in response to specifically what Tracy said, is the only thing that I think uh, is, is different from me and her, and it's obviously just because I'm on campus and she's in New Orleans, is that I think that President Bourne, along with other administrators on campus, understand the safety issue, right? I want everybody to understand that, regardless of the expulsion, um, when I read the apology letter coming from both of those students, they tell—if uh, I remember correctly, they, were, they said that they withdrew, right? Um, uh, I've also heard uh, different— a perspectives from professors saying that they have received emails from some of their students say that I'm scared to come to class uh, because I'm a part of that fraternity, right? So it's a safe space issue. Also, for the other students uh, that see SAE on the media being symbolically uh, demonized and said, uh, put in this uh, such of a bad light, which um, all in all is something that they put on themselves, but it's a question of how do we create a safe space on campus? So I think that that is a precedent that has been uh, set um, in response to what we did as far as the protest, there were two things. The first thing was the morning, uh, Monday morning, I think everybody saw the video. The video leaked Sunday night, if I'm correct. Monday morning, we had a 7.30 silent protest, right? Uh, in the midst of that, I got up and spoke about the role of white students. One of the things that bothered me the most was that it were so many people, like we were saying before, chanting on the bus. Now, it probably was a few uh, individuals, i.e., the person who was recording, that were uncomfortable with the chant, but for the most part, everybody uh, was uh, all in. And the question comes is, what is the role of the person on that bus that disagrees? What is the role of the person who sees racism in front of their face and does nothing? I think that they are a part of the problem. I think that everybody has a role. We need to understand that an inaction is, in fact, an action in itself. And if you see racism and injustice and you do nothing, you are only helping perpetuate that very system. And uh, the second thing is that we marched in front of the SAE house. We wanted to celebrate the ending um, of that fraternity and the ending of us tolerating injustices at all. We don't want it to be a stamp of saying we're done with racism, racism is over, but rather a stamp of saying that I take a pledge to vow myself and understand that I am in part a role of all of these structures, and I must take honus on what I can do to stop perpetuation of racism and injustice whenever I see it. Vince Warren of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Yeah, I think that Rashid and Tracy lay out a very nuanced approach to this, and I want to complicate it a little bit more um, by two things. I want to talk about um, the president, the, the basis for which uh, the men were expelled, and uh, one of them was creating a hostile environment on campus. And I also want to address what Rashid said about creating a safe space. And while those fr those frameworks work really well in some context in discrimination, like in employment law, you don't want to have a hostile work environment, and of course you want to have a safe space so people can exchange ideas. I think that's important and it's key. However, we have to be careful about uh, the the way that we're framing these discussions because. Because what we don't want to do, and I think both Tracy and Rashid would agree with me, is we don't want to create such an environment that people are not honestly and openly exchanging their ideas. And so the idea of the safe space and the hostile campus environment, of course, is the same framework that's used by universities when trying to tamp down against uh, 
pro-Palestinian uh, activists or people that are challenging Israel. That's the first place that they go. It's not a safe space for the Jewish students on campus. It's creating a hostile uh, campus environment. And that's why I think that it's important to have these longer-term discussions, because there is no simple solution to structural racism. But one thing that we have to do is we have to be uh, nuanced and, and fair as we think about what the ramifications of these things are. I think, finally, um, you know, the, the challenge is I have a 17-year-old that's uh, going to college next year as well, and I don't want to see him to, to, I don't want him to be at a school where there's a fraternity where they're saying black folks can't come on. But at the same time, I'm thinking about how he would engage that and how he would build a core of friends who would be able to push back against that. And I think that Tracy is right that the conversation, and Rashid, that the conversation needs to happen on campus. But I also think that the president is right uh, in saying that, in cutting ties with the with the head of the, of the beast and cutting tie, ties with the beast as well, to send that message that there will be accountability for when people cross the line. I wanted to read the letters from the boys. Um, one of the boys wrote, apparently his own, Parker Rice, said, I'm deeply sorry for what I did Saturday night. It was wrong and reckless. I made a horrible mistake by joining into the singing—and I repeat that—by joining into the singing and encouraging others to do the same. On Monday, I withdrew from the university. Sadly, at this moment, our family's not able to be in our home because of threatening calls, as well as frightening talk on social media. Um, and then the family of Levi Pettit, the other young man who's been uh, expelled, um, Brody and Susan Pettit said of their son, he made a horrible mistake and will live with the consequences forever. Um, they said, we are sad for our son, but more importantly, we apologize to the community he has hurt. We also like to apologize to the entire African-American community, University of Oklahoma student body and administration. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Rashid this question. Um, with Parker Rice, who said, um, I made a horrible mistake by joining into the singing, he, he wasn't the only one, um, and encouraging others to do the same. So, if you're for the expulsion of these two students, but also know you want to deal with structural racism on campus, what is being set in place? Uh, not only what the president, David Boren, has said, but as you come back from spring break, what will happen? Uh, my hopes for what will happen. Well, first off, in response to uh, Mr. Rice, I think that um, there is a very uncomfortable, is an extremely uncomfortable situation, and I think he's embarrassed. Um, and I hope that the apology is genuine. I want to say that on behalf of many people, because uh, I feel the sentiment that folks feel on campus is that you're apologetic because you got caught. Right? And the question is, are you truly apologetic because you understand what you said was wrong, or do you understand that you uh, you shouldn't have been saying those things or believe those things in the first place? The second thing I want to say as far as after, you know, post-spring break is that, you know, my major, for instance, African and African American Studies, the AFAM department, is a major that is not taken or taken as seriously uh, as I believe it should. The funding that's towards it is um, not as much as it should be or as equal as other departments, for example, when we have conversations um, about race, I want to point out that there are many um, amazing professors at the University of Oklahoma that do teach about structures of racism and how to deconstruct those things in your, inside your own life. I think there needs to be more scholarships, funding, um, and, 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 and general money put towards, I guess, the precedent or the 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 serious situation of how racism sets itself up, not only as a structure, but how people can perpetuate um, and linger onto those structures without having any repercussions. I think that uh, we have departments that are trying and attempting to do those things, but they are not being supported as much as they should. And I think uh, my major is one, uh, one of the examples. So I think that that does a lot. Uh, and I think we need to have other strategies as well. Um, but I think that if that comes, at, like, like Tracy said, the university is a learning ground. The university is where students um, become actors. It was a meme going around to say, and they took a picture of the kids on the bus and said, listen, these are your next senators and governors, right? Now, although that can be funny, a lot of it is truthful, right? The people that we are at the university with are going to be the next, you know, president-born senators and et cetera, et cetera, right? So if we're not training these students in the ways that they should engage with society, which they inevitably will, um, then we're only doing injustice for ourselves. Uh, so I feel like that is the best strategy as far as, you know, solving for the structural racism.
Tracy Washington, your response. I appreciate what Rashid uh, just said. Look, I'm a parent of a college senior at Grinnell College, and, and all colleges, big and small, deal with this. Vince, call me. I'll, I'll give you some advice on it. <laughs> but uh, it, it, at the same token, you, you know, we understand, Amy, I can't judge these 17-year-olds uh, who, who've done this horrible thing and made these chants. And I'm talking about the two that have been expelled. By the same standard of myself, understanding anti-racism. And so, and, and, and I'm coming from that perspective with all of these things and all of these hats that I wear. They've got to learn. Um, it is a, a space where students need to learn. They are 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, I'm, I'm not going to excuse in any way. We can't excuse what they've done, but we've got to teach them to do better. And, and, and to Vince's point, and the big point that I made, or at least in the beginning of my blog post, I want everybody to understand that we are also dealing with a public university, not a private college or a private university. There are rights here that must be afforded students. If we are expelling them simply because of what they said and how offensive it is, I'm going to be then concerned about what happens when that Z5B, Zeta Phi Beta student, comes in and says something that other people may find offensive um, about a, war, a white sorority. You know, I, I just want us to breathe a second, Amy, and understand that when we're dealing with racism and, and, and teaching against racism, it can't just be one small segment here. It's huge. And it takes a lot of work. And I don't know yet whether that university is really prepared for the work that's going to be involved in anti-racism on that entire campus. And I want that for you all, Rashid, because next year, this will happen. It'll happen tomorrow. You just won't hear about it. And President Boren has a phenomenal opportunity right now. I want you all to look upon this after spring break as an opportunity to reach out to those of us in civil rights and doing this work to say, help us. You know, we want to make our university better. And truly, truly, you guys can be that beacon that also leads other universities in getting it right, getting this right. It's so incredibly important. They will be your senators, your next senators. You know, um, they will be your next congressman. And, uh, and, and so we got to make you all better. Final comment, Vince Warren. Um, I think we've really um, encapsulated some of the, the real chief challenges that are here. And, and, and my thought is, um, as Rashid and Tracy point out, it's about balancing um, what, what we were trying to build moving forward with what are the steps that are necessary right now in this moment. We have a challenge in social media where stuff comes up immediately, people have immediate reactions. Um, but I think ultimately, I go back to Bernard Lafayette and Selma and it says, and that says that essentially the bravery of the moment is how we act, how we stand up to, to injustice, how we act and move towards that, and what kind of systems are we building to correct it? Before we end, I wanted to bring up another issue. Uh, I wanted to turn to Amy Ziering, who is the producer of a new film called The Hunting Ground, which exposes how colleges nationwide cover up sexual assault on campuses. In the wake of the release of the racist video, Amy Ziering told CNN that this fraternity uh, on the campus, you know, of University of Oklahoma, but is a nationwide fraternity, SAE, is also known across the country for sexual assault. When we traveled around the country uh, looking into researching the epidemic of assaults on our campuses, time and again we'd ask students, where, what, what have you heard on your campus? Where is it dangerous? And they would say SAE, and we'd say, really? You know, and then we'd also ask, what are, are there any nicknames for any of the, the fraternities on your campus? And time and again, they would say sexual assault expected is the nickname for SAE. 
So that's Amy Ziering, who's the producer of The Hunting Ground, about <coughs> sexual assault on college campuses. Bloomberg has also called Bloomberg News has called SAE the deadliest fraternity after finding there were nine deaths associated with SAE events between 2006 and 2013. The, those deaths include uh, George Desdoon, a 19-year-old black student from Brooklyn, New York, who had his hands and feet tied with duct tape and zip ties during a hazing ritual. He was blindfolded and given so much alcohol he died. Tracy Washington, um, you are a civil rights attorney in New Orleans. Uh, you're an adjunct professor. You are CEO of the Louisiana Justice Institute. Had you known SAE in other contexts? I've known about the fraternity and in the context, unfortunately, of the sexual harassment and sexual assault cases doing uh, Title IX work in my private practice and consulting with schools. And uh, you know, I can almost make the same analogy about what's going on now with this race and racism issue with SAE, as I could with—and trust me, it's not just SAE, with, with fraternities and fraternal organizations throughout this country and tolerance. My concern is not only about the horrible sexual assault issues that are encapsulating and, and consuming many of these schools. It's the reactions of the schools and the communities. It, it, it can happen only when there is tolerance of bad behavior. Um, time and time again, not only do I hear about what has happened and investigate and learn, you know, about um, what's happened with just the actors, but also who knows about it in the fraternity? Who knows about it outside the fraternity and in other fraternities and sororities? Who knows about it and staff? Because there are staff inside these houses. We, we saw the, the brother who was the cook inside the SAE at Oklahoma. Who has he been speaking with? What, what administrators then now know? And what, cons what, what bothers me, what angers me, is that it's being tolerated. And I, I don't want us to leave this conversation about anti-racism, race and racism on campuses, and sexual harassment and assault on campuses without also putting responsibility on communities, administrators and faculty and staff to, to when they hear about it, do something about it. And that's not happening. I don't put it all on the students. Students get scared. Um, they've got some responsibility, but there's fear in that community. The grown-ups on the campuses, they have a they have a higher calling and responsibility and duty, in some instances, legal duty, to do better. And they're not. They're failing. Well, we want to thank you all for being with us. Tracy Washington, president and CEO of the Louisiana Justice Institute, Vince Warren, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, and champion debater Rashid Campbell, um, a senior at the University of Oklahoma, majoring in African and African American studies, who participated in the protests against the Sigma Alpha Epsilon SAE fraternity after that leaked video showed some of its members singing this racist chant. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea.